Um, I'd now like to invite to come and tell us about their experience in Auckland DHB, um, Lawrence Walker, who's a cardiovascular ICU consultant, and also Luke Flynn, who's the charge nurse of their patient at risk service. Lawrence and Luke, wherever you are, please come. Oh. Hi everyone. Um, yeah, just like to introduce ourselves. Like Alex said, I'm Luke Flynn. I'm the um, the charge nurse of the patient at risk team um, from ADHB, and uh, this is Lawrence Walker. We're going to do a bit of a dastardly duo kind of talk, so we'll be swapping backwards and forwards a bit as we're going through. Um, and just want to tell you a bit about our experience, um, particularly around the development and delivery of our service, but really focusing on the governance governance structures that we have in place. We're such a good team where you have a team approach to talking as well. Um, so a, a lot's happened at ADHB over the last two years. Um, there's been a complete restructure um, of the way that we look after the hospital, um, especially after hours um, and how it relates to senior nursing support to the wards. We've introduced a patient at risk team and we've rolled out the National Vital Signs Chart at the end of last year. Um, but before we talk more about that, I'll talk a little bit about some background and sort of what happened before 2017. Um, so we had a local EWS based vital signs chart which had actually been in place since about 2010. Um, it was, there was variable uptake of the chart throughout the hospital and some of the escalation pathways weren't always adhered to. Um, we didn't have a dedicated patient at risk nursing team, we had a fantastic team of clinical nurse advisors um, who were very experienced nurses who really became the problem solvers and um, the Mr and Mrs Fixits of the hospital. Um, part of their job was um, seeing deteriorating patients, but increasingly as the hospital got busier, uh, especially after hours, their job more became um, around supporting the nurses with complex sort of nursing tasks, accessing porta caths, going to the pharmacy, all that sort of thing. And um, their patient deterioration component of their work started to um, get less attention. Um, there was no overarching clinical governance of patient deterioration and the CNA team didn't have um, uh, any sort of strong direct medical oversight. Um, the data collection was pretty variable and quite poor, it was mostly call centre related data. Um, and increasingly the clinical board were made aware of adverse events relating to failures to escalate. And I think as the hospital got busier and busier the patients were getting sicker um, uh, it became apparent that it was a pretty safe place between 8 and 4 p.m., but after hours and on the weekends, um, it wasn't quite as safe. Um, so, and in 2016, the provider group, which was essentially um, all the clinical directors and the professional leads, um, decided to really um, focus on um, how the uh, hospital ran, especially after hours, and um, the deteriorating patient work was a really big part of that change. And in 2017, um, uh, there was a big 24-7 restructure. And this came from the CEO, from the um, Chief Operating Officer, so it really did come from the top down. Um, so it, in 2017, the CNA role was disestablished. We introduced a PAR team. Um, we were very lucky to have eight of the existing CNAs come into the PAR team and we, get, we had five new um, ICU nurses from the two ICUs at Auckland City. Um, Luke came on as the um, PAR charge nurse, we managed to get him back from Australia um, and uh, I had a 0.5 FTE role as the PAR SMO and I've since realised that I'm quite lucky and that I talked to a lot of my colleagues around the country, um, it's quite unusual to have dedicated FTE. Um, in, this, in this manner and I think um, I empathise with the, with the clinicians around the country that don't have that because um, I certainly don't think I could have done or you know, coped without that support. Um, so I reduced my time in the CVICU. We've also had team admin support and a patient deterioration governance group was established um, and that had very wide representation and that's been a huge support to us over the last couple of years and Luke will talk more about that. All right, so yep, just talking a little bit about our um, governance structure. Um, prior to the introduction of the patient at risk system, there was, there was a little bit in place, but mo mostly focused on the resuscitation perspective. You know, we had our res resuscitation committee um, who 
did a lot of great work, but got a lot of but got bogged down quite a bit in some of the finer details. You know, the the ampule of amiodarone is changing slightly, so it's got to come through the thing. The the defib pads are changing slightly. Um, you know, what suction handle should we use? Really bugged, bogged down in the, in the finer stuff. So um, the patient deterioration governance group was established. Um, it has direct um, reporting up into the clinical board, so we've got really good teeth, I like to think. Um, and from that, we've developed a bit of a substructure. The sort of pivotal part of that su substructure is um, the PAR team. And I've put adult on here. I really want to be um, clear that at ADHB, um, we have two, two hospitals under the sa on the same site. Um, and I want to acknowledge that Wendy Sullivan is pregnant, uh, present. <laughs> present somewhere. <laughs> Sorry, Wendy. <laughs> um, and she's the charge nurse of the Child Health PAR team. Um, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Um, the, the PAR teams make up the front, the front line, um, the front line structure. But in line with that, we're also developing other structures to manage some of the other stuff that got the teams bogged, bogged down, such as uh, the patient deterioration equipment group, um, who manage those finer details and bring recomm recommendations up into the, um, the governance group. And one of the things that we're really working hard on at the moment, or the governance group is working hard on at the moment, is um, our approach to deteriorating tra uh, patient deterioration training and education. Um, we've developed our ADHB simulation service and um, the, the, the vision is that both the equipment group and the, deter and the education group work closely with the PAR team so that the education and equipment that we're using is really strongly tied to what's happening at the front line. Um, some of the, uh, the achievements that this, uh, the governance group have had so far has been the, the introduction of the PAR team. Um, the establishment of the equipment group and the, and the uh, simulation service. Currently working hard on that education structure. Um, moving away from our traditional education structure a little bit of a, a really almost um, sole focus on resuscitation and really bringing it back to that, that, that um, deteriorating patient approach. Um, the role, there have been key leads in the rollout of the, the Auckland version of the NZ early warning scoring system. When I say Auckland version, it's just our response pathway. <laughs> um, and, and the ongoing management and direction of the team. I really want to acknowledge the PAR team members that are here today, and there's a group of them sitting over there, the ADH PAR, D PAR team members, adult PAR team members, um, because without this work, you know, the, the deteriorating patient group would be, um, wouldn't have the teeth that it does and wouldn't have the emphasis that it does. The membership of our, of our governance group is really wide ranging. Um, Mark Edwards is here, he's the chair of the group and also the, um, the director of quality and safety at ADHB and we've got really good representation from across the directorates and services at, at ADHB. Um, this has been important, it's allowed us to have the, um, the um, guidance into, into each of those things and each of those um, services and, and directorates and um, you know it's still a work in progress we're still developing some of our systems um, but it's allowing us to, to really get the momentum up and get the mo momentum going. Um, the PAR team like Lawrence said a, a group of very senior nurses um, huge amounts of of uh, experience a lot of them have ICU uh, some of them have ICU backgrounds but that but not all, and and I really, um, you know, some of the skills that our our non ICU based nurses bring to bring to our team are extremely valuable from a hospital operational perspective. Um, we worked hard to develop our team vision and our team charter, and we developed our um, our values based on the ADHB core goals. But the real um, driving factors behind the team values are the leadership teamwork communication that we've heard talked about in Matt's, in Matt's story this morning, um, but a real emphasis on support and education, uh, support and empowerment of our frontline ward staff. We don't want to be seen as the people that come in and take over. We want to be seen as the people that support deteriorating patient strategy at Auckland. Um, 
we were key in the rollout of the NZU's in the NZ early warning scoring chart, uh, we uh, used a real uh, mixed methodology approach, um, and the PAR team were a key part of that because you know they're responding, they're continuously cementing the, the practice and the, and the culture. Um, we used a phase rolled out. We used a mixture of um, a train the trainer based approach with online delivery and also ward based champions to make sure that the um, the process was getting across. Um, and we've got quite a strong auditing process. We've just developed it. As we're still a paper-based system, we need to audit quite closely at, at the, at the um, chart side, I suppose you say. Um, and we've just developed an app to help with that as well. So, so um, big things are happening there. It's, it's a pretty cool thing to be a part of. Really want to mention the, um, the input that our performance improvement team at ADHB have had into all levels of our um, governance, our Par, par structure and our early warning scoring um, score rollout. Cool. Going back to Lauren. So, um, talk a little about data. Um, like I said before 2017, the quality of the data and the organisation was pretty poor. Um, and it wasn't really, um, there was no central um, uh, uh, responsibility for collecting it and reporting it. Um, and in particular, it was call centre data, it wasn't NHI, NHI linked. And in particular, the cardiac arrest data was probably um, uh, overestimated because if you um, went into labour and in the uh, foyer of our hospital, you had a, a code blue called, which is like a cardiac arrest call. Um, so we developed a database very closely with the child PAR team. Um, it took quite a lot of work, like, uh, um, agreeing on the measures that we were going to record, That's that balance between um, getting the information you want but um, not having too much unnecessary information that's going to take a long time for the PAR nurses to enter. The nurses enter uh, into the database for every um, patient interaction from a, from a, a low grade e raised EWS to a code. Um, uh, it's a concerto based database, so it ties in with our patient management system and clinical record. Um, and we also enter a database entry for all PAR, PAR follow-ups, but the form is very simplified. Um, but over the last year or so, um, we've started to get some reports generated from the database. It's really helped us. I think it's really important to have good data to improve your service and, and sort of move forward. Um, and uh, it's helped us tailor some of the education to certain areas as well. Um, now we, we submit our data, our HQSC um, uh, quality safety measures every quarter and now when we submit those it only takes about an hour or two to collate all the information because it's all there with some automatic reports. We've developed an app for the process audits and if anyone's interested in that we're very happy to share it. Um, and over the next six months we're really going to start focusing on feeding back some of the data to the wards um, so that uh, they can sort of see how they're going and identify opportunities to improve. Um, and Luke will talk about one of our reports. So, th so this is an example of the daily um, activity report that I, that I get sent, sent to me. It also goes to Lawrence and Mark. I think we're the only ones it goes to at the moment. We're hoping to Expand on that. It gives us a, expand on that. It gives us a really good idea of our past service workload, what we're seeing, um, and we can drill down into these report into this database to see where we're seeing it, what's involved, all, all that, all the details. Um, October was a particularly busy month for us. Um, we saw 1,128 patients. Um, that includes the the um, met escalations, the cardiac arrest calls, um, the first reviews of, of a PAR nurse for a new deterioration and follow-up reviews. So, so quite a lot of um, work goes into that, nearly 1,200 um, patient encounters. About 20% of that is, is, um, is met team escalations and a very small percentage is, is, the, is the cardiac arrest calls. All right, um, so like I said, we've got a minute and a half left, but this is uh, actually call centre data, um, and this is the number of um, rapid response team escalations or met calls in, in um, Auckland City Hospital over the last 10 years. Um, if you have a look at 2017, we saw over 2,000 met escalations. A lot of that big increase was um, because we really started to emphasise that it was a mandatory pathway in all um, uh, met escalations were mandatory. Um, there was some variability with um, how that had been interpreted prior to 2017, so I think that was um, the, the reason for the big jump. 
And uh, looking at 2018, we're looking at about 2,000 meat escalations again. Um, and this is of interest to us because uh, the College of Intensive Care and their um, uh, uh, policy around um, rapid response systems tells us that if we're look, looking after over 2,000 or seeing over 2,000 um, meat escalations a year, we need to start thinking about having a dedicated ICU officer um, to, to attend these, these calls and to um, and to manage the patient deterioration outside of the ICU. Um, a couple of interesting things over the last two years um, when it comes to um, uh, the, the MET team escalations, um, drilling down a little bit closer is um, I think this arrow, this, at the start of 2017 we started to emphasise the importance of mandatory escalation. Um, and then in the middle of 2017, we introduced the PAR team. And then in uh, November 2017, we rolled out the National Vital Signs Chart. And I think it's reassuring that we haven't had a significant increase in the number of um, MET escalations since the rollout of the chart. In fact, it's, it looks like it's kind of plateaued off. Um, so in summary, um, I've got to finish. Um, we've had amazing support from the top down. I think that's been a huge part of our success over the last couple of years. We've had a huge amount of support from the governance group. We've been really well resourced um, within the team and that's been um, of huge help, including support from performance improvement and business intelligence and we're using data to sort of guide service improvement. Cool.